Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 269 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Welcome back to our Team Favorite series, a series where you get to meet three of my Omohundro Institute Digital Projects teammates and where they tell you all about their favorite episodes and why they love them. Now, last week, I introduced you to my teammate, Joseph Fadelman, and he told us why our conversation with Nick Bunker about the life of young Benjamin Franklin stands as one of his favorite episodes. Well, this week, you're going to meet Holly White, the Omohundro Institute's Assistant Editor of Digital Projects and OI Publications. Now, you may have already interacted with Holly in our private Facebook community. She's a real active presence in that group. She's always posting pictures, asking questions. Plus, Holly is a really big help behind the scenes where she helps me read and research for many of her episodes. Now, I have to admit, when Holly told me what her favorite episode was, I was surprised because Holly chose a really early episode, an episode from the podcast's first year of production. Curious which episode stands as Holly's favorite episode and why? Here's Holly White to tell you about it. Hi, my name is Holly White. I work as a producer on Ben Franklin's World, and I'm also the assistant editor of Digital Projects and Publications at the Omohundro Institute. So my role on the podcast is I provide research and episode production support to Liz. My favorite episode is from 2015. It's episode 32. Michelle Marchetti Coughlin, One Colonial Woman's World. I really enjoy episode 32 because it tells a fascinating story about an early American woman, Mehetable Chandler Coit, and her 17th century diary. As a historian, I find Mehetable's diary a fascinating source. First, it's the oldest known early American woman's diary in existence, but the source itself tells us so much about the average woman's life in early America. Now, here's Liz and Michelle. I hope you'll enjoy this episode. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Michelle. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm excited you could join us because One Colonial Woman's World really sheds light on what daily life was like for women and families in colonial New England, and not just in the 18th century, but in the 17th century as well. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and how you became interested in early American women's history? Sure. Um, Well, I've always been interested in history, and early on, I was particularly interested in 19th century history. But then I took a class with Sack Van Berkovich, and it was on the Puritans, and that really helped me see the Puritans in a new way. And I was just fascinated by them as a people. They're so complex. Um, There are so many writings, uh, their writings that have been left behind. And I'm also just very interested in that period of American history because, you know, with the settlers coming over from England, and there are all these different ideas here and all of this change, and it's really, it is a new frontier. So I'm very interested in that period. And I became interested in women's history. Um, I was pretty much always interested in women's history, but I was just dismayed when I was studying this early period to discover just how few women's writings were available for study, but also how few women from this period had been studied. And I believe there's still, you know, it's getting better. More and more people are studying early American women, but there's still a lot of work to do, I think. And I think the period is kind of still dominated by male narratives. And I think if you're not hearing stories about women and people of color from this period, you're just really not getting the full picture of early American life. And it seems one of the things that hinders scholarship on early American women is the fact that not aren't necessarily a lot of records left behind. And in particular, it seems that diaries kept by women during the 17th and early 18th centuries are really rare finds. And yet you managed to find one. So how did you discover Mehetable's diary? Yeah, so I was doing a research in early New England diaries, and this grew out of a graduate school project. And I was um, disappointed to discover how few women's diaries from the period were available for study. This is, of course, because many had been lost to time 
but also because many women of the period could read but couldn't write. So in the 17th, early 18th century, it was believed that everyone should be taught to read so they could read their Bible, but writing was looked upon as a specialized job-related skill that was necessary for men to conduct business and not really necessary to be taught to girls. So as a result, not many of the not many women of the period had either the time or the ability to keep a diary. So when in the course of my research, I came across a volume of extracts taken from Mehitabal Chandler Coit's diary that had been published by her descendants in 1895, I was immediately intrigued and began to wonder whether the original manuscript might still exist, particularly since historians generally believe that no 17th century diary by an American woman has survived. And Mehitabal's diary has about about a dozen pre-1700 entries uh, in the diary. So, you know, it's conceivably one of the earliest American diaries written by an American woman to have survived. So when I started looking for Mahinable's diary, the descendants who had edited the volume of extracts wrote that at that time, in 1895, that the diary remained in family hands. So I hoped that this might still be the case. And I began compiling a family tree to see how it may have descended through the generations. And at the same time, I began contacting a number of museums and libraries to see if they might have the diary. Early on, I made the fortunate decision to get in touch with Yale University. Yale didn't have the diary, but they did have two of Mahitable's letters that had appeared in the volume of extracts. And they also had a treasure trove of about two dozen letters written by her mother, mother mother-in-law, sister, daughter, and friend between 1688 and 1743. And this is a really rare collection of early women's writings that not only shed a lot of light on Mahitable's experiences, but also provides a lot of insights into early American life. So Yale's records said that the letters had been donated over a period of time beginning in the 1950s by a New York woman named Elizabeth Anderson. And that at that time, Elizabeth Anderson was also the owner of the diary, although they misidentified the diarist as Mahitable's daughter, Martha. And the record said that Elizabeth Anderson had died in 1950. So I started looking for her obituary, figuring that this would provide the names of her heirs and thus possible owners of the diary. But I couldn't find any record of her death. And by this time, I had figured out where she belonged on the family tree. She was the great granddaughter of the diary volume editor's brother. And the the diary volume editors were actually Mahitabal Coit's great-great-granddaughters. So I decided to take a step backwards and look for Elizabeth Anderson's parents' obituaries, hoping that they might provide some helpful information. So her father had died in 1939, and the result, his obituary wasn't very helpful. But her mother had died in 1964, and her obituary contained the revelation that Elizabeth Anderson was still living at the time. So evidently, Yale's records had been wrong about her death in 1950. So the obituary said that at that time, Elizabeth was living in a small town in upstate New York, and on a whim, I decided to contact the assessor's office in that town to ask how I might find out when Elizabeth's house had sold, figuring that that information would bring me closer to her actual date of death. And amazingly, the clerk in the assessor's office was able to tell me right away that the house had sold in the 1980s, and she was also able to provide me with the name and number of the buyer, a local realtor who happened to have been a friend of Elizabeth's. So I called up the buyer. He told me that he and Elizabeth had stayed in touch for several years, but he hadn't heard from her in about four years, and that she had, he knew she had moved to Pennsylvania, and he suggested I speak to his wife, that she might know more. So called up his wife. She hadn't spoken to Elizabeth any more recently, but she was able to put me in contact with Elizabeth's former handyman, who uh, provided the reassuring information that her cemetery plot remained unfilled. And he also put me in touch with her former housekeeper. So the housekeeper had been in contact with Elizabeth as recently as a year before and was able to confirm the name of the assisted living facility where Elizabeth had gone to live. So I contacted the assisted living facility, asked to speak to the social worker, and was informed, much to my delight, that at 95, Elizabeth was still alive. So the social worker suggested I write Elizabeth a letter rather than trying to speak to her on the phone because she was hard of hearing. And although my immediate impulse was to jump on a plane and go see her, I was ultimately glad I heeded the social worker's advice because Elizabeth ended up not being quite sure what she had done with the diary. She thought she might have donated it to Yale along with the family letters. 
So this was a very discouraging development, but then the social worker put me in contact with Elizabeth's closest relatives, a cousin and his wife living on Long Island. Called up the cousin's home, his wife answered the phone, I explained why I was calling, and she said, oh, I have that diary right here. So this was very exciting, and what was equally thrilling was that when the couple soon sent me a copy of the original manuscript, I saw that it contained a wealth of material not included in the published extracts. There were poems and medical remedies and recipes, and all this information really helped round out a picture of Mahitable's story, as well as adding to the historical significance of the diary. And I do have to say, another way that the original manuscript differed from the volume of extracts was that in many ways, the entries did not appear chronologically, but rather appear to have been organized thematically. So one page might have entries relating to journeys that Mahidwal or members of her family had taken. Another page might have entries relating to the launchings of her husband's ships. But the very specific nature of the dates confirmed that they were recorded at or very close to the actual time of the event. And I took the diary's inscription, which is Mahitable Coit 1714, to indicate that Mahitable acquired this particular volume in 1714 and then copied into it entries from an earlier journal or collection of scraps of paper. So that is the story behind finding the diary. Wow. I didn't know that that story was that involved. I mean, you were truly passionate about this subject that you were willing to put in all that genealogical research and effort into tracking it down. Yeah, it was it was amazing that it actually worked out. And, you know, it's just so fortunate that everyone, all these different people I talked to along the way were willing to help me out and, you know, that it had such a happy conclusion. Now, you receive photo stats or pictures of the diary, but have you ever seen the original? I mean, what does that diary look like? And yes. what made yeah. you, I mean, I guess we've already covered, you know, what made you want to write about the book, but it seems very special. Yeah, it is. Um, so, that you know, originally the couple sent me copies, you know, Xerox copies of the book, but then I did go see the original and it's about three and a half inches by five and a half inches. It's leather, uh, leather covered volume. You know, it's, shows its age, but it's in very good condition. They take great care of it. And um, in fact, I did a talk in New London and the diary owner came out from Long Island and brought the diary. So that was, you know, fun for people to see that. But um, yeah, it's just, it, it really is a remarkable document. And, you know, another caveat for the diary is that it's a life record. Medwell kept it from the first entry dates from 1688 and the final entry from the final dated entry from 1749, but it's not by any means a daily record. It's only about 50 pages long, and the entries are very brief. They focus almost exclusively on external events, and they show very little emotion or introspection. And this is because the Puritans, and Hannibal was a Puritan, believed their diaries were proper places to record their daily activities, but also to document the ways God worked in the world around them. They really saw everything as being part of a divine plan, even the most ordinary of occurrences, such as changes in the weather or births and deaths in the community. And they favored a very plain style of language because they believed it was best for seeking spiritual truth. And the diary form that we're familiar with today really didn't start to develop until after the revolution when the new nation began to develop an appreciation for the arts. People began to explore the diaries' opportunities for self-expression. And as society became more secular and more appreciative of the qualities of the individual, people began to use diaries as tools for self-exploration. So these, you know, these were challenges uh, for researching Mahidwal's story because her entries are so brief, but it took a lot of research. The research and writing process took about 10 years, but it really paid off because I was able to provide a lot of context for her very brief entries, and I really tried to flesh out her life as much as possible because I realized that this was a very rare opportunity to have this uh, life record from one woman from this time period. And so I really did try to delve into as much of her life, uh, as many aspects of her life as possible. It, it was amazing once I did start the research, just more information kept turning up. And that kind of goes to my a point I always make is that even though certain groups of people may be challenging to research, I've found in different projects I've, I've been involved in that once you do start to research, you do 
come across leads that lead you to other sources. And if you're kind of creative in looking for sources, you might be surprised at what you're able to find out. Let's talk about the life of the diarist. Who mm-hmm. was Mehetabel Chandler Coit? What can you tell us about her life and accomplishments? Yes. So Mehetabel was born in 1673 in Roxbury, Mass, near Boston. And when she was about 14, she and her family became some of the first settlers of Woodstock, Connecticut. And then when she was about 21, she followed her brother and his family when they moved to New London, Connecticut. And there she met and married a successful shipbuilder named John Coit. They had six children together, lived a relatively comfortable life until John's death in 1744. And Mehitable lived the final 14 years of her, her life as a widow. She died in 1758 at the age of 85. And so that's, that's the bare skeleton of Mehitable's life. But she, you learn from her writings and the family writings that she really did live a full life. In addition to running a household and raising a family, she read, she wrote, she traveled. There are financial accounts in the diary indicating that she engaged in a wide variety of economic exchanges with people in her community, both men and women. And letters that her daughter Martha wrote to her from Boston and Newport in the 1720s indicate that she had a wide range of acquaintances in both of these places, even though she had never lived in either location for any period of time. And it's unclear how she made these connections, but they were evidently very important to her and they served to link her to a wider world. And uh, another way to get to know Mehitable is through, actually the most basic way to get to know Mehitable is through her writings. And I was very surprised at the range of writings in the diary. We have recipes, we have medical remedies, we have um, excerpts from poems, we have, there's even a little humor. I thought it was interesting that she definitely is paying attention to current political events. Only there are a few references in her writings. For example, she writes, one of her earliest entries is April 18th, 1689, The Revolution at Boston. And here, of course, she's referring to the coup that Bostonians staged following the deposing of James II, following the invasion of England by William of Orange and his wife, Mary. And as we know, the colonists greatly disliked James because of, he had arbitrarily replaced their elected form of government with a royally appointed governor and council. And his first appointee as royal governor, Sir Edmund Andros, came in and instituted a number of sweeping changes. He imposed new taxes. He restricted town meetings. He really curtailed the colonists' political liberties. So even before they had received official confirmation of William and Mary's having taken the throne. The citizens of Boston arrested and imprisoned Andros, and this is a move that would inspire another group of Boston patriots generations later. So Middle takes note of this event in her diary, and although she doesn't record her feelings about the event, elsewhere in her diary, there's a poem that begins, For the few hours of life allotted me, grant me, great God, but bread and liberty. And these lines are taken from a well-known essay of the time called Of Liberty by a writer named Abraham Cowley. And Cowley begins his essay with the proposition that the liberty of a people consists in being governed by laws that they have made themselves, the liberty of a private man in being master of his own time and actions. And I think it's pretty amazing that within the context of the patriarchal society in which she lived, Mehitable was engaging with Kelly's ideas about personal and political freedom. And I think it indicates that other women of the time, although they were excluded from the political process, were also engaging with these concepts as well. And uh, just one last thing about Mehitable as a person, there's a great little anecdotal line in the, the volume of extracts from her diary dating from 1895, where the descendants write, there's a traditional remembrance of Mehitable Chandler Coit as a person of unusual power, mentally and physically. So I thought that was, that's an intriguing characterization. And then Mehitable's 21st century descendants have come to refer to her as the incredible Mehitable. <laughs> you mentioned that Mehitable grew up in Roxbury, Massachusetts, but mm-hmm. then she and her family moved to New Roxbury, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us why many early Americans decided that they would leave a settled area like Roxbury for the frontier? of New Roxbury in Connecticut. And can you describe each of those locations, like where is she living and then where is she moving? 
Yes, and you said New Roxbury, and that's what the settlement of Woodstock was originally called, New Roxbury. So Roxbury, Mass, it was a wealthy community. It was very close to Boston at the time. It was home to many of the elites. It was a, a lovely town. Mahibble's family was not among the elite. They were in the middling classes, but they were definitely social, socially upwardly mobile. They moved to Woodstock because it's why many other people moved at that time for land and opportunities. And so once they did move to Woodstock, New Roxbury, her father and her brother were able to acquire vast tracts of land. And they also became selectmen and they became very prominent in town government. Her father became a deacon. So they were really, really upwardly mobile. Now, Mahidabal and her mother and her sister, on the other hand, had a very different experience because in Roxbury, they would have had access to many consumer goods because they were close to Boston. They had a a well-established home. They had access to hired help to help them around with the, around the house with the different household chores, but they went to New Roxbury and there weren't many people settled in that area at the time. So of course there was not much in the way of options as far as either hired help or consumer goods. So they had to produce everything on their own or do without for the most part. There were some traders that went back and forth between New Roxbury and Boston, but of course this would have taken some time. And they were isolated from other family members and friends. So I I think um, this is one of the major reasons why Mahidabal chose to leave when she was about 21 and go with her brother to New London. We know that her sister, Sarah, writes to her later on when New Roxbury is experiencing difficulty with the Indians, the reasons people had moved out to New Roxbury would stuck uh, to begin with was that after King Philip's War, the local Indians had left the area and it offered uh, wonderful agricultural land and it's still a very agricultural community. But then Indians started coming back and of course later conflicts developed. So the New Roxbury was in a position of just really having to fend for itself. It was in a position of great difficulty. There was a point where um, some Indians attacked a family in Oxford, which was the nearest community, and killed several members of the family. The remaining members of the family escaped to Woodstock, and the people of Woodstock put out a call for help to the Massachusetts government. Uh, at this time, New Roxbury, Wood, Woodstock was still part of the of Massachusetts, later became part of Connecticut. Help was very slow in coming, and the people were ordered to stay put because they had to defend the community. So they, they were in a very difficult position. And at one point, when Mahidabal was married and living in New London, her sister Sarah writes to her, have you forgotten garrison fears, you who are now in prosperity? And ironically, Mahidabal must have then asked Sarah to come visit her in New London because shortly thereafter, Sarah was married to Mahidabal's husband, John's brother. So... So it seems like you move for prosperity, but at least in the 17th century, it comes as a, at a real price, which is, you know, your safety and, and comfort. You mentioned that Mehetable married John Coit of New London, Connecticut. She marries him about, what, June 25th, 1695. Would you mm-hmm. tell us about the match? You know, who was John Coit? How did he and Mehetable meet? And while we're on the subject, what are early New England courtship rituals like? Mehetable probably met John Coit through family members that she had in New London. Members of her mother's family were among the early settlers of New London. And that's likely how she met him. He, as I said, he was a successful shipbuilder. He came from a shipbuilding family. And for many years, his family shipyard was the largest in New London. So they're, they're very well to do. We don't, unfortunately, have any surviving writings between Mahidabal and John Coit, which is unfortunate because it would have been great to find some insight into their relationship. Um, but basically, during this time period, love was considered to be integral to the success of a marriage. And, you know, we have kind of a stereotype that some people still kind of believe in that marriages were arranged and they were arranged at a very early age. And, and both of those stereotypes are untrue. Um, Mahidabal was married in her early 20s, as were most brides of this time period. Certainly there were exceptions. One of her sisters married at 16, but girls typically married or women typically married in their early 20s and men were typically a couple of years older. So love was very considered very important to a match at the time um, and social rank was considered extremely important. You wanted to marry someone who was within the same social status as you were. 
So Mandible's family and John Coit's family came from a similar social status, and they were also very involved in the local church. Now, although marriages weren't arranged, parental sanction was considered very important. People did want their parents' blessing. And so it seems that this was very likely given that John Coit's family and Mahidwal's mother's relatives traveled in the same social circles out in New London. Now, the courtship rituals were, of course, different from what we have today, but there were chances for socialization prior to a marriage between a couple who were courting. They would go to social events. They would see each other at each other's homes. Of course, this, these visits would typically be supervised. And then once they decided to marry, their parents would make some financial arrangements. Each set of parents would make some type of contribution to the couple to ensure that they were on a good footing when they started their married life together. So I did say that love was considered very important to a marriage at this time, and marriages were seen as a partnership. However, the man was always considered the head of this partnership. And a woman, um, she did not enter into the marriage state very lightly because once she did so, she would become, enter femme covert status. Basically, her identity and her legal rights would be subsumed under those of her husband. So it was not a step that one took lightly. It's unfortunate that we don't have any writings between the two when we have so many writings between Mahidable and the female members of her family, so we can get insight into those relationships, but not really into the relationship between her and John Coit. They were married for a very long time. I think it was probably about 50 years. So one hopes they had a good relationship because it was a very long-standing relationship. There are some listener questions that have been submitted about what life was like for Mahidable and other women like her, just in terms of you know their daily lives. So once Mehetable married John Coit, she became the woman of the house. And Shirley's would like to know what chores or social activities average women like Mehetable would have performed on a typical day. Oh, there were many, to be sure. Even if you were a, um, a well-to-do person and could afford help, which I want to return to that point in a minute. But basically, there was a great pressure on women of this period to be considered notable housewives, that they were capable of accomplishing a wider range of tasks in the household efficiently and economically. So there were, it was not only the responsibility for overseeing meals and kitchen gardens and livestock and sewing and cooking and cleaning and candle making. It, you know, the list is seemingly endless. But many women were able to have some help. Some had hired help and some had slaves. And Mahidable and her husband were the owners of four slaves that we know of, Nanny, Nell, Mingo, and Peter. And Mingo and Peter likely helped John Coit with his work at the shipyard and perhaps just basic household work, um, outdoor household work, you know, around the farm. But Nanny and Nell would have helped Mahidable with child care and with domestic, basic domestic work. And probably, um, in particular, Nell, who was younger, helped probably with the most disagreeable tasks, you know, the hardest, dirtiest tasks, because why would you do them yourself if you had a slave who could do them for you? And this is something that needs to be considered when we think about, you know, Mahidable's workload was heavy, yet she did have this assistance. And I think veering off on a different point, considering that she did have this very heavy workload, as did all women of the time, I think it is amazing that she was able to continue to keep her diary throughout her life. And although the, you know, it's not, her diary is not like a 19th century diary where you see 19th century diaries where women pour out their hearts and their feelings. It's, it's not that type of a diary. But the fact that she was able to maintain this commitment to her diary, I think, is pretty amazing. And one important point I did want to make about Mahidable as a diarist was that she probably got her love of writing from her mother, Elizabeth Douglas Chandler. And when I was researching Mahidable's story, it was the very end of the process. I had finished the research and writing, and I went to the Yale archives to make sure nothing relating to Mahidable had escaped my notice. And there I found a 64-page poem written by her mother, probably completed about 1681. It's called A Meditation or Poem, being an epic of the experiences and conflicts of a poor, trembling soul in the first 40 years of her life. So it's basically a narrative of Elizabeth Douglas Chandler's 
spiritual development. And as I said, probably completed about 1681 when she was 40. And it's an amazing piece of writing. And then after I finished the book, I was contacted by a descendant, a retired attorney in Seattle, who happens to have a 17th century letter book that appears to have been kept by Elizabeth Douglas Chandler as well. And this is only 18 pages, and it's um, a very idiosyncratic document. It contains letters both sent and received by Elizabeth Douglas Chandler. However, not all of these letters appear to have, she doesn't appear to have been either the original author or recipient of several of them. And a number of them are love letters. And the authors of some of these letters are signed with an initial and some not in, not at all. So there's a lot of documentation in the family that supports that this was Elizabeth Chandler's letter book, but it really presents a whole different side to her character. And uh, again, just the fact that these women took the time out of their very busy lives to preserve these writings, I think is amazing. And I think that the recovery of the diary, the letters, the poem and the letter book, I think it's a really strong indication of the that other women's writings of this period that have been forgotten, overlooked, or misidentified may yet come to light. And I think that hopefully with the development of new online research tools and finding aids and specialized databases that they might become that much easier to locate. How typical was it for an early American or early New England family to own one or more slaves? And how did families integrate the slaves into their households? Did they have separate houses for them, like on a plantation? So those are very good questions. Um, it was it was pretty typical um, in seaport areas for families to have slaves. Of course, they would. It was nothing like southern slavery, where there were large plantations with many many slaves. Uh, typically, a house might have one or two black servants, and their living quarters were in the house with the family. So this type of paternalistic system developed, where the slaves were considered part of the family, as were white servants. And yet, of course, they were not considered to be on the same level as flesh and blood family members or even the white servants. It was a less harsh system up here, but it was still a very harsh system because, of course, any system where you're deprived of your personal freedom or your right to be with your family is very harsh. We know that Mingo and Peter were married. It does not seem that they lived with their wives, so they were clearly separated from their families. And now we're not sure whether she ever married or had children, but John Coit, when he made his will in the 1740s, after Nell had been with the family for almost 30 years, writes that he would give his Negro woman Nell to Mehitable unless he decided to sell said Negro woman. So they lived this very precarious existence where You know, even after being with a family for decades, there's still the possibility that you could be sold. And New London had a lot of slaves and uh, some black free people in its population because of its involvement with the maritime trades and, of course, the triangular trade where, you know, at its most basic level, rum would be brought from New England to Africa to be exchanged for slaves who were brought to the West Indies who were sold and exchanged for the molasses and and sugar came from the West Indies uh, and then brought back up to New England to make more rum. And of course, some of the slaves came up to New England on these voyages too. They didn't remain behind in the West Indies. So one really helpful source in researching the slaves of New London was Joshua Hempstead's diary. He was Mehitable's near neighbor and actually a distant cousin. And he kept a diary dating from 1711 to 1758 that's been published. It's much more of a daily record than the Hittables is, and it provides a lot of information about the slaves who lived in New London. And he actually provides a lot of information about the Hittables family. And ironically, the final entry in his diary is old Mrs. Mehitable Coit died today, and then he himself died a couple of weeks later. Wow. Well, we have so many different things to talk about. But before we get to the time warp, I'd like to try and get to just a few more listener questions. One listener would like to know about childbirthing and what it was like in the late 17th and early 18th century. And as Mehetable had several children, who would have seen her through her labor and deliveries? Would it have been Nell? Very good question. So childbirth was a communal event, as many other rites of passage in early America were. So 
Mehitable, when she was ready to give birth, would have been surrounded by neighbors, family members. She was done with childbearing by the time Nell came into the household. But, you know, there would have been a lot of people in that house when she was ready to have a baby. Of course, it was a very dangerous event. There was a lot of risk for both the mother and the infant, not only during the process of the actual childbirth, but then afterwards, there was a great risk of postpartum infection, and that actually killed more people than the actual labor did. Now, what's really interesting is Mahidabal's mother-in-law, Martha Coit, left behind a childbirth testimonial dated from 1681 that talks about how she goes into each experience of labor just being really fearing for her life and how she trusts God will deliver her from this experience. And yet she is still overcome with doubt and fear and then how God brings her through each episode. And this she left to her children to be an instructive letter to trust in God at all times. But I, I'm sure Mahidabal saw this, this document and, you know, it's interesting to consider how she might have related to it, um, what her fears might have been at that time. Wow. It's tough to imagine, especially today when we have hospitals and, and other things that make childbirth thing uh, just so much drugs. safer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Drugs. Monique would like to know how much influence an average woman like Mahedable would have had over her husband. And when she sent this question, she specifically referenced how historians like to describe the influence Abigail Adams had on the ideas and opinions of her husband, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, that was it. Abigail and John Adams was a true partnership. We can't really make assumptions about Mahedable and John's relationship or other relationships of that time, unless we find some documentation. And you do see letters between married couples and um, that are full of endearments and testify that they had this really close relationship. Of course, you would assume that after being married for decades and your your wife is serving as your helpmeet, that you would trust her counsel. Uh, in Mahidabal's case, she we know she kept accounts on her her own behalf. Um, she talks about trading different items, cloth and clothing and rum, but that she also kept some accounts on her husband's behalf. So she was assisting him. She was what, you know, there's a common term of a wife acting as a deputy husband during this time period. And so she was definitely assisting him in his record keeping. She documents the shipyard workers, apprentices who come to stay with the family over a period of time. She also makes notations about different ships that are launched from the shipyard. So she's paying close attention to the business. And it's very likely that John Coit was aware she was helping him in this in this way and appreciated her help. But I really can't testify to their relationship because of all of the material and information in detail, I was able to uncover about different aspects of Mahinable's life. The one thing lacking is anything really that testifies to their relationship other than John Coit's will. He did leave a uh, good provision for her when he died to make sure that she would be taken well care of. But that's really the only written document from John Coit that I uh, was able to locate. And it's actually interesting, this family through the generations really treasured the women's writings, but the men's writings are kind of few and far between until you get to the 19th century. You know, it's interesting because in episode 18, Danielle Allen, who wrote Our Declaration, and in episode seven, Sarah Giorgini, who's an assistant editor at the Adams Papers, both of these scholars mentioned that one of the reasons we know so much about John and Abigail Adams is they spent so much time apart. So that's why we right. have the documentary trail. So I wonder mm -hmm. how many times you were like, I wish Mehedable and John spent more time apart so yeah. I'd have letters. <laughs> but I mean, I'd I like guess, to have something, yeah. You know, those long distance relationships weren't typical. Most right. married couples stayed together for a long time. Before we move on to the time warp, one last question. Teresa would like to know how early American women did their laundry. She's wondering in the 17th and 18th century, you didn't typically have running water in your house. So where do you get the water and do you wash inside the house or in a, in a river? Right. Uh, I think it varied. You know, I think it entailed getting, and this would be one of the most unpleasant chores. And this is something that, Nell would be doing because it's a lot of heavy lifting. You know, it has a lot of different steps of getting the water. I think people got the water from wells and brought it to the home and then heated it over the fire so that, you know, you would have hot water for washing. But it was backbreaking work carrying the pails of water and then just dealing with the heavy wet clothes. 
so yes, I, that would be something that Nell definitely would have helped with. Well, thank you for taking the time to answer our questions, but now it is time for the time warp. What if Mehetable had kept more detailed entries in her diary, or if she had updated her diary more often? What would you like to know about her life that you don't already know? Or perhaps what would you like to know more about the lives of early New England women in general? Uh, well, there are a, a lot of mysteries still remaining about Mehetable's life. Different information I came across that I, I wasn't able to find additional details about that I did have questions about. For example, the Reverend Cotton Mather, you know, very well-known Boston minister, uh, notes in his church records in May of 1693 that he admits a Mehitable Chandler. And there's much possibility surrounding the fact that this could be our Mehitable, that she may have been back in Boston during this time period. But there's really no way of knowing for sure. And the fact that Mehitable never officially joined another church, she was very close to the minister in New London and his wife, and she was very religious and very involved in the local church, but she never officially joined. And that's surprising. And that leads me to believe that she likely did join Cotton Mather's church and just never officially was dismissed from the church, which would have enabled her to join another church. Another mystery surrounding her life that I would like answered is her daughter writes to her from Newport in 1722, I believe it was, I hear you have had Ben Uncas to visit you. And Ben Uncas was the leader of the Mohegan Indians, which was the largest tribe in Connecticut. They lived in the New London area. And there's really no telling why Ben Uncas would have been to visit Manville. I'd love to know the reason behind that. And finally... I'd like to know why uh, in her diary, when Mehitable records her entry about Nell coming into her household, she writes, Nell came here in September in 1717, she then being 20 years of age. And then she writes Nell with these two long dashes after it. And it's really unlike anything else in the diary. And it leads me to believe she wanted to record something more about Nell, but found herself unable to articulate her thoughts. And I'd love to know what she wanted to say about Nell. Of course, I'd also love to know what Nell might have said about her. And I'd love to know more about the four slaves in general. And of course, if her diary had been more detailed, I'd like to know how she felt about her life. And that's something that I'd like to know about early New England women in general. How did they feel about their lives? You know, you get a lot of external detail, but the intimate thoughts and feelings you really can only get from letters that survive at the time. So that's what I hope to continue researching, find out more about how these women did feel about their lives. Before we conclude, would you tell us about what you're working on now, how you're working to get at how early New England women felt about their lives, and perhaps if and when we can visit Abigail Adams' birthplace? Yes. So I serve on the board of the Abigail Adams' birthplace, and the birthplace is open various times during the year. The open hours are on the website, which is abigailadamsbirthplace.com, and we always welcome visitors feel free to like us on Facebook. And we have recently done some major programming there. We'll have more programs coming up soon, but we did a program recently on the slaves that uh, belonged to Abigail Adams's father and what it was like for her growing up in a slave owning household. And we also did the latest in a series of Women's History Month author panels. This one was on trailblazing women and it was on Anne Hutchinson, Margaret Fuller, and Amelia Earhart. As far as my own writing, I have uh, an article coming out about Abigail Adams's maternal grandparents, the Reverend John and Mary Mason Norton, that will be coming out in uh, American Ancestors, which is the magazine of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And I am working on a book on Penelope Pelham Winslow. And she was the wife of Plymouth Colony Governor Josiah Winslow. She's a fascinating figure because she lived part of her life in England, part of her life in New England. She survived both the English Civil War and King Philip's War. And I plan to look at her life in connection with different family members, as well as servants and slaves owned by that family. So there's a lot of connections that can be drawn there and proving to be a fascinating project. 
So where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? Yes. Yeah, so, and, um, and I'm continuing to do uh, different talks, um, and these are listed on my website, which is onecolonialwomansworld.com. Okay, and we'll include a link for that in the show notes page. Thank you so much for joining us and telling us all about Mahedible Chandler Coit and for answering our questions, Michelle. We enjoyed it. All right. Thank you very much, Liz. I, I enjoyed it myself. Thank you. Mahedible Chandler Coit was an everyday woman, and yet she was also remarkable in that she kept a diary. As Michelle revealed, many early American women could read, but very few could write because Early Americans believed you only needed to know how to write if you were going to practice business, which is not an opportunity that most early American women had. Of course, as we know, not having an opportunity to practice business does not mean that early American women didn't work hard. Michelle provided us with many examples of the hard work that women performed around their households to keep them running when she kindly answered all of our questions. You can find more information about Michelle, her book, One Colonial Woman's World, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash zero three two. Finally, is there something more about Ben Franklin's life that you'd like to know about? Drop me a line, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.